Good morning. We're in John 10 this morning. If you want to be joining me, John chapter 10. It's good to be together. Good to see you. I do hope that you are well and safe and that we all stay that way and protect each other and respect each other and enjoy being in one another's company, yet maybe at a distance and visiting with each other from a few feet away, and certainly it's good to, to be together. I uh, have watched the, the elders wrestle with, with the decisions that they've had to make, and, and, and now with this whole internet thing, and, and how long, and what do you keep doing, and, and we're, we're thankful that we have that, and certainly there are people at home this morning that are able uh, to worship as we are, in, in a safe environment, and they have their reasons for doing so, but nothing replaces face-to-face. We can call on the phone, we can talk on the phone. I've tried to encourage all of us. Uh, one of the elders said this morning that, that the goal is for us to stay together spiritually, to stay united, to stay, uh, to keep that camaraderie and closeness that we had, and, and you can do some of that by phone, and so I've tried to encourage all of us to be calling, texting, all of those things that we can utilize. You can worship through technological avenues and study the Bible together, but, but at the end of the day, uh, being able to see each other is uh, something that you just can't, you can't do, you can't replace that. And so I'm thankful that we are able to be together and certainly I uh, hope that we're all uh, well and safe in that. In John 10, a few weeks ago, we looked at the idea of Jesus saying in verse 7, I am the door. And then we kind of fast-forwarded a little bit to chapter 11, and I am the resurrection and the life. And then last week, we fast-forwarded even further to chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then today, and I I don't know why, I don't understand the the scheduling of the devotional book, but but it, it comes back. It goes out there a little piece, and then it comes back to this idea in John 10 and verse 11, where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is obviously in the same context of verse 7, where he said, I am the door. And we looked at a couple of weeks ago about this whole imagery of shepherding. When we go back into the Old Testament, the passage that Gene read a moment ago from Ezekiel 34, there's a a long passage there, about 24 verses, in the first 24 verses of Ezekiel 34, and obviously for time's sake, we didn't read all of that, but I would encourage you to do so. But that section in the middle there, verses 11 through 16, maybe you caught all the, the imagery of I am the shepherd. The Lord's talking there, and He's talking about Israel. And all throughout the Old Testament, there was this image of God being the shepherd and and Israel being the sheep. And God would use terminology about leading and feeding and guiding and protecting and gathering, all of that type of language to describe this situation that, well frankly, is lost in our society. Because what we do today is we stretch a, a hot fence, don't we? And, and we plug it into the outlet and we say, okay, if you're going to go through that, it's going to hurt, right? That's how we do it today. We don't, we, we, don't, we don't shepherd like they did in the days of Scriptures. And so to, to think about an image where, where Jesus would be sitting and, and would look out across the hillside over there and, and would see a herd of sheep, would see a flock of sheep out there and, and would see a, a guy close by and he would be sitting there, standing there, walking around maybe, leaning up against a tree or something in that arena to to be close by he would be watching if he was a a good shepherd he he would be watching he would he would go and 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 you know encourage a sheep that might be trying to drift off from 
from the flock to, to get back in, you know, and, and all of those type things. And you could drive across the countryside and you could see these, these vast rolling hills and it would just be a, a common image. Early in the morning you would see the shepherd taking the sheep out to, to graze. And then late in the evening you would see them bringing them back in and putting in a, a corral of sorts to, to, for the night to rest. And so all of that imagery is what's our backdrop here with Jesus saying things like, I am the door. Understanding that there would be a gap in the corral and he would say, I am the door. And if you want to go in the right way, you must go in through me, the door. Go in through the shepherd. Here he would say, I am the good shepherd. Now, the the first term we have there is is an adjective. It's the word good. Now, in your your Greek Bible, you have two Greek words translated good. One would be the idea of righteousness. One would be the idea of goodness, if you will. And obviously that would be in contrast to evil or bad, okay? So you would have one Greek word, it would be very specific, it would be very limited. And, and anytime you see that, you would think this person is acting or behaving in a good way. And so it would be a reference to a particular lifestyle that was good in nature. The other Greek word that's translated good is just a generic adjective. It's broad. It's, it's big. That's the one we find here. It can mean things like right, good, proper, fitting, honorable. I mean, it's just got a bunch of, it's just, it's just a broad word that can have a lot of different meanings. And so as we think about that this morning, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. And in so doing, he uses this broad adjective to describe good, to describe right, to describe fitting, to describe honorable, to describe justly. In other words, he fits, he is proper, he is the right one. It's more than just this idea of good versus bad. And, and we don't always get that in our, in our English language because it just says good. He is good. Well, what does good mean? And on this particular occasion, it has a wide, broad range of meanings. But certainly all of them can fit and all of them. But we could've, he could have called himself the right shepherd. Or he could have called himself the proper shepherd. Or he could have called himself the fitting shepherd. Or he could have called himself the honorable shepherd. All of those would have worked and all of those would have been fine in the translation. But typically it is translated the good shepherd. As a matter of fact, if you have paragraph headings in your Bible in front of John 10, you probably have the paragraph, I am the good shepherd. And so... It has been translated and termed that way in verse 11. And then he uses the word shepherd. But we've already mentioned that, that idea or that image. What we know from passages like John 9 and verse 36. As Jesus goes into the city there and he sees these people in misery. He, he refers and he acts as the chief shepherd. What we see when we fast forward in our Bible to Matthew 18, beginning in verse 12 and going through verse 14, is we see Jesus portraying this image of the chief shepherd. In other words, there are sheep out there that are wandering, that are lost, that need to be corralled, that need to be guided. And so what we conclude then, Jesus referring to himself as the chief, as the good shepherd. We also understand, just from a a doctrinal standpoint, and just to remind us, that on a local level, we have shepherds, don't we? We call them elders. I was talking to, actually talked to two or three people recently who have been fascinated by the, the change in terminology. It does appear that more churches today are referring to their elders as shepherds that that seems to be a 
a, a term that is uh, uh, rising up again as a common reference to. Of course, we could call them elders. We could call them pastors. We could call them shepherds. All of, all of that referring to the same person, the same role, the same function, the same responsibility within the Lord's church. And of course, it's the beauty of the setup of God. God made each local congregation. We're not, we're not guided by an association or, or a, an, an institution that is higher than the Leoma Church. We are guided, we are governed, if you want to use that word, by shepherds, plural, more than one shepherds. And you, you probably don't call them that very often, but maybe it would do us all good to do that. And to remind ourselves of the value and the role and the function of, of a shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the chief shepherd. I am the highest of shepherds. But then under Jesus... And following the authority of Jesus, there are local shepherds. Kind of like Paul, you might remember in Acts 20, as he's talking to the shepherds, to the elders at Ephesus there. And he says, take care unto yourselves and to the flock. In other words, pay attention, Acts 20 and verse 28. Pay attention or give close heed to yourselves first. And unto the flock which God has made you overseers, which He purchased with the blood of Jesus. So we understand that obviously in Ephesus there, there was a congregation of the Lord's people. And Paul is encouraging her leaders, her shepherds, to pay careful attention to the flock. I, I don't know anything about animals. I don't even know why I have any, but I try to, to, you know, I just enjoy animal life, although I don't know anything about it. But here's what I know. I know if you get behind the cow and kick it, it'll run most of the time. If you get behind the goat and kick it, it'll run most of the time, if it hadn't already run. Sheep are just dumb. I don't know what else to say. You can't get behind them and kick them. They, they're not going to go. You can't get behind them and and prod them. They're, they're a different type of animal. They just r respond different. I, I don't know all the ins and outs and why. But what I do know is that, is that sheep are a, a, a unique type of animal. And it is very interesting that the Lord would use the sheep. That the Father would use the sheep in the Old Testament to describe this relationship of, of shepherding. And understanding that, that sheep need, I guess they need more care, they need more attention, they need uh, more help uh, because of, of maybe some in, inadequacies that they have as an animal. I, I don't understand all that, I don't know. But what I do know is that, is that they are different. My brother has three sheep and, and they're, they're just a different animal. Than, than any other animal. They don't seem to react the same way any other animal does. And so it's interesting to me that Jesus would spend all of this time in John 10 and this big, long context about, about sheep and their shepherd and the importance of, of Him as the Good Shepherd. Back in 2013, we went through the I Am statements. And back then I pointed out four things that the Good Shepherd does from this passage. I'll just point them out to you again. Guess what? They ain't changed in seven years. It's, it's still right here in front of us. Number one, He leads. The Good Shepherd leads. You begin in verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter by the sheepfold of the door, but climbs in another way as a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls them by name and leads them out. A good shepherd, the good shepherd, leads. When you hear the word lead, as I mentioned, most animals you can drive. 
Most animals you can get behind, herd up, corral in, and drive them, as we would say. And you can take them where you want them to go. It may be that a stubborn one here and there needs a prod stick or something, but for the most part, you can just kind of get behind them and push them where you want them to go. But what I understand about sheep is that, is that they, they, they don't work like that. They'll just lay down or, or work to fight their way back through. You can't drive sheep. You've got to lead them. In other words, you've got to get out in front of them and call to them and bring them to you. You can do that with other animals. I'm not suggesting you can't. But in order to get sheep to move in a direction that you want them to move, you must lead them. The idea here is to get out in front and call by name. You see what Jesus says, The sheep hear my voice and I call them by name. He says, I lead them. I get out in front of them. It's not an effort to, to push or, or to kick or, or to, to try to stubbornly get them to go where you want them to go. But no, rather you get out in front of them and you say, okay, I know where we're headed. Jesus says, I know the destination. Jesus says, I know how to safely get there. I'm going to get out in front of you. I'm going to call you by name. And I want you to come and follow me. Matthew 16 and verse 24. Paul would say, I want you to imitate me as I imitate Christ. You follow me as I follow Christ. The good shepherd leads. He gets out in front of to guide. He knows by name and is able to call out by name notice the thief verse one the robber goes in a different way but verse four says when he is brought all out on his own he goes before them i think about what peter said and this whole imagery of shepherding in the new testament church having jesus as the good shepherd and then having local shepherds for each flock for each congregation Peter would say in 1 Peter 5 to fellow elders of which he was one to fellow shepherds he would say lead by example lead by example read the first four verses of 1 Peter 5 not under compulsion not demanding but willingly lead by example in other words get out in front of and call back to the sheep to come and follow. I'm going the way of righteousness, and I want you to go the way of righteousness with me. A shepherd would know where the sheep needed to be and where the places of safety were and where the places of, of good feeding and grazing were. The shepherd would know where the streams were or where the pond was or where the spring was. To be able to gain water in a safe manner. And so the shepherd says, I'm going. And he would call back to the sheep and say, you come follow. What a powerful image that righteous men would get out in front and call back by name to sheep following to bring them along with them in the path of righteousness. A good shepherd leads. But then number two, a good shepherd protects. Notice verse 5. A stranger, they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they, they, don't, they don't know his voice. And so Jesus would say in verse 7, I am the door, and all who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the door, verse 9. We dissected verse 9 a couple of weeks ago. If anyone enters by me, listen to the protection. He will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus says, anyone who follows me will find rest, will find protection, will find safety. For he says in verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy 
but I come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And because of that, I am willing to protect the sheep. I think about David. You remember David's plea before King Saul? When King Saul says, David, you, what, what, what do you mean this giant out here? I mean, this guy's been fighting war longer than you've been alive. What, what gives you the resume to make me even think for a moment that I should let you go fight this giant Goliath? Jesus, I mean, David rather says, well, you know, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I've been pretty successful in the, I mean, you fought any wild animals lately, King Saul? But in all of that story, David, what are you saying? Obviously, David's pointing out the protection of God for him. But let me tell you how you kill a lion. You've got to get out in front of it. You, you can't kill a lion with a stick running from it. No, if all you've got is a staff in hand, I don't know, maybe he had his slingshot, I don't know. But you, you can't kill it running from it. No, you've got to get in front of it. You've got to step in the way. You've got to put your life on the line. David says, I was out there with those sheep, and the lion came to, to devour my sheep, and I couldn't let them do it. No, no. I had to protect them. Jesus would go on to say here in, in our passage of context, verse 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Any good leader is going to stand out in front of to protect those that are more vulnerable. I, I, don't, I don't think it's any coincidence that, that God designed the family the way He did. And that He put the father, the husband, as the leader of the family. That He, that he would even call us that to describe us that way to explain the function I can't imagine for the life of me somebody breaking into our home tonight and me rolling over and going, Hey, Chastity, somebody's broke in the house. I can't imagine for the life of me doing that. I don't think that way. I don't react that way. I don't respond that way. No, somebody breaks in the house. There's people in the house that are vulnerable, and I'm not one of them. I I'm going after them. In the same way, a shepherd... The idea of protection here. We get it on a physical level, but it also works spiritually. You see, we need help because there's an enemy out there. We need protection because there, he describes it, Jesus describes it here as a wolf. Peter describes him as a lion, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Whatever image you want to use to describe Satan, we've got, a, we've got an enemy out there that seeks to break in and destroy our lives. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I will lay down my life for the sheep. He goes on in verse 12 to make this contrast here between a shepherd and a hired hand. And he says, let me tell you about the hireling. Let me tell you about the hired hand. When he sees the wolf coming, verse 12, he leaves and flees and the wolf snatches them. He leaves, verse 13, because he has a hired hand. Jesus making the contrast, I am the good shepherd. I will lay down my life for the sheep. Unlike the hired hand who, when trouble comes... They run. When the enemy attacks, they flee. Why? Because they're just a hired hand. What do they care? Why are they going to be bothered with that? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life. I think about the shepherd boy, David, standing between the enemy 
and the sheep. A good shepherd protects the sheep from the enemy. But then verse 13, number 3, the good shepherd cares. Do you hear what he said? The hireling or the hired hand flees. Why? Because he cares nothing for the sheep. He don't care. Contrasting what? Contrasting the good shepherd. Jesus says, I care. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, Philippians 4 and verse 6. Don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Sufficient for today are its troubles, Matthew 6 and verse 34. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Cast all your cares upon Him. Why? Because He cares for you, 1 Peter 5. In verse 7. Or Matthew 10. Jesus says, Not a sparrow in the world falls to the ground without your Father in heaven knowing it. Are you not of much more value than a bird? Sure you are. God's got the very hairs of your head numbered. That's how much He cares. That's how much value you have. That's how much He loves you. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd cares, verse 13, for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, verse 14. I know my own and my own know me. Why? Because I care. Because they matter. It is a level of commitment. It is a level of concern. And and I'll say this. When we're not together face to face, it's harder to share in the lives of one another. It is. It's more difficult. It's harder to know what's going on and what's causing people difficulties and struggles, not just spiritually, but also physically even. And who is in need of encouragement? And who is in need of prayer? And who is in need of a pat on the back? And who is in need of an of a encouraging pick-me-up? Physically or spiritually or both. It's, it's harder to show care when, when we're not together. And so that's what I enjoy about being together. Is that we can care and show a level of commitment and concern for one another. I'm not saying there isn't other ways to do that. I just think face to face is where we really learn what's going on with each other. And where we're really able to express our care and our concern. The good shepherd is involved, committed to the sheep. You know, I, I'm not an animal farmer at all, but I, I go see my animals more than one time a day. And what I can tell you about my animals is I can tell you when they don't feel well. And those of you in this room that are animal farmers much larger than I, you know the same thing. Why? Because you... You know your animals. You know how they normally react. You know how they normally respond. You know what the normal reaction is to you coming out there. And when that's not the case, then you know something is wrong. I'm I'm not a veterinarian, so I I don't know what's wrong. But I know something's wrong. it's, It's a level of commitment and concern for the sheep that would allow the good shepherd, Jesus says, I know when something's wrong. He even knows what is wrong. He even knows how to fix it. But he says, I care enough to to feel your pain, to understand when you're going through difficulties in life. I'm committed to you enough to lay down my life, not just in protection, but out of care and concern. But then number four, verse 15. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. How many times have we seen that phrase already? Two, three? But I want to point out something to you here as we close. That a good shepherd provides. A good shepherd provides. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Jesus says in verse 15, He's already said it a couple of times, I lay down my life for the sheep. 
oh, Jesus meant something much greater than just, than just being out there in the field and standing between the sheep and the enemy, didn't he? Oh, yes, he did. Listen to verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, but I must bring them also. In other words, there's Gentiles that are about to come in, and they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus is done. He, he's out of the pasture now, ain't he? He's done flipped the switch on them. For this reason, verse 17, the Father loves me because I laid down my life that I might take it up again. Oh, you want to talk about provisions? Oh, sure, the shepherd provides grazing land. Sure, the shepherd provides water. Sure, the shepherd provides shade. Sure, the shepherd provides a safe place at night to sleep and rest. Oh, but Jesus, He done, he done went higher than that on them. Oh, He done flipped the switch. He's in the spiritual realm now. He, he, he's done talking about things that they don't even understand at this point. Not sure that they fully understood them at any point. He says, let me tell you something. I lay down my life. I am the good shepherd, and I am going to lay down my life for the sheep. And when I lay down my life, I'm going to take it up again. Look at verse 28. I, gave, I give them eternal life and they will never perish so no one will snatch them out of my hand eternal life you want to talk about the good shepherd providing oh it's important to be led by the good shepherd absolutely when he calls out you need to follow as a sheep it's important to stay in the protection of the good shepherd, because there is an enemy out there seeking to devour and to destroy us. We must recognize that the good shepherd cares. Oh, he cares deeply. He cares so much for us. But of all the things to understand about the good shepherd, don't miss at all the point that he provides. What does he provide? Life. John 10 and verse 10, you remember what he said back up there? Abundant life. I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. John 10 and verse 28, I gave them eternal life that no one would perish, but that they all might take hold of it, that they might not be snatched out. In Ephesians 1 and verse 3, the Bible says, All spiritual blessings are found in one place. And that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 of Ephesians 1, Paul would say, In Him we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness from our trespasses. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. You want to talk about the Good Shepherd? you got to understand the Good Shepherd provides. He provides in a way that no one else can. Thus he would be able to say, I am the good shepherd. I am the right shepherd. I am the fitting shepherd. I am the honorable shepherd. I read a story this past week about an actor who was on stage. The actor was on stage and somewhere in the course of the script there, the actor just busted out in the 23rd Psalm. You ever heard it? He began it like this. The Lord is my shepherd. He went on and completed the psalm, some six verses there in Psalm 23. He looked out amongst the crowd. And he, he, he saw some amazement. He saw some, you know, awes in the crowd. He looked across the crowd and he saw one of his religious leaders. And he called him to the stage. And he said, I, I would like for you to read to these people the 23rd Psalm. And so he began like this. The Lord is my shepherd. He began it the same way. But when he got done, people were crying. And as the actor got back on stage and saw the emotions of the people, he couldn't help himself and he said, 
I know what the difference is. I've got it. I know the 23rd Psalm. He knows the shepherd. Now let me ask you. Are you the actor? Or are you his religious leader? Do you just know the 23rd Psalm? Or do you know the shepherd of the 23rd Psalm? makes a difference not only makes a difference in the reaction of people it makes a difference in your eternal destiny Jesus said I am the good shepherd are you following the good shepherd are you living in the path of the good shepherd to enjoy the protection and the care and the provisions that he offers there's nowhere else to be found only in the good shepherd. Is he your shepherd? Do you know the shepherd? If not, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.